Hello and welcome to The Good, The Scars and The Rugby. I'm Alma Smith and we bring you the show together with our friends at Allianz. Uh, welcome back after two weeks away. Mike Tyndall, uh, dad of Lord Lucas, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm upset that I've missed the last two shows. I have listened to them. I thought Hask has stood in fairly well let's let's be honest it's, it's as good as i can uh, appraise him of but uh, no i'm glad to be back um lucas is very well very hungry which is good he's growing nicely so hopefully we might get another rugby player um, but we'll see golfer just we'll just talk golf that's all he gets to watch just sat feed watching highlights of golf so we'll hopefully we'll get either a rugby player or a golfer we'll see well, we, we got such great value out of James Haskell last week. Um, if you didn't watch or listen to that episode, go treat yourself because he was such a fanboy for Shannon, Shannon Courtney. It was brilliant. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I when I listened to it and the, obviously she talked a lot about the nutritional side of it and he was he was just completely over that and how she got into boxing <laughs> and the fact that she just went to lose some weight and then she turned out to be a fighter. I mean, I thought it was a it was a fascinating story yeah. and, and Hask just fanboying over it was, was always nice to see. He's just a puppy dog, really. He's got this bravado, but he is, he's a puppy dog, really. Well, speaking of amazing uh, metamorphoses and uh, life-changing moves, a warm welcome to our guest this week, Olympic sprinter turned member of the GB bobsleigh team, Montel Douglas. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Oh, lovely. Thanks for the clap, guys. We were doing claps earlier. They were a lot, they were a lot louder than that. Um, <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to be on. Well, we're going to definitely dig into your story shortly because there is so much there. But there's one person amongst us here who captained England to another Six Nations title this weekend, just like that. Emily Scarrett. Congratulations, Captain. <laughs> Thank you. Well done, yeah. Skips. Well done, yeah. Skips. It was cool. It was the like, Sense and I, Sarah Hunter and I shared lifting the trophy, obviously, because she's our normal captain, had some struggles with injury. But yeah, it's the first time I've kind of been a part of lifting it so that was really cool I think he takes that sort of stuff for granted I suppose when you're not the captain or you know they you sort of see those guys doing it but yeah it was cool. it did look like you enjoyed the moment though you both did I thought it was it was a it was a nice moment so yeah um... it, like Suns is one of my like closest friends as well so it, I, I suppose being able to share one of those moments she's had a really tough ride as well she's been out for 13 months injured so I think for her that's kind of a a big um kind of I don't know thing in terms of how, how hard she's worked to, to get back um but yeah it was cool but I, what I didn't realize was standing in the middle you just get absolutely sprayed with Sorry. champagne is it oh, my <laughs> eyes were screaming I know we should explain about things like that yeah. <laughs> screaming, it stank but yeah I think there's a there's a thing called first world problems yeah. that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I tell you what the the worst thing is is now you 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 back home now. No, we're still in camp. Oh, are you? so we oh, travel okay. to France tomorrow for a friendly. Oh right, yeah, a back to back <laughs> friendly, <laughs> lovely. Uh, is that so much, be... yeah, so much to be friendly about over there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there'll be nothing carried over because I tell you what, it was on the weekend. It, it might have been scrappy and it, no one really settled into their game very much, did they? But um, because of the errors that were there, but it was physical. My God, was it physical? So, yeah, I'm sure that's just what you need when you've had a massive physical counter to win a trophy, and then yeah. one's really happy, getting sprayed with champagne in the fa in the face, and the other's miserable and grumpy, but gets to wreak revenge the next week. Oh, good luck on that one. Yeah, Enjoy that. It's going to be tough. It was super physical. I, yeah, the game was not um, a pretty spectacle, perhaps of what we wanted it to be, but it's a final. Sometimes you've got to grind it out and we've got the trophy and I can guarantee you in a few years time, no one's going to care about what the scoreline was or how pretty yeah. it was. Um, so yeah, it was cool. But yeah, we're short turnaround as well. Cause we're playing Friday night, 9 PM playing Friday night in France. Uh, after, a, hmm. after a sleeper coach, Jen, <laughs> this week has been um, different for sure, but um, yeah, I'll let you know how the sleeper coach is tomorrow. So that was a really close scoreline, 10-6, considering the massive blowout scores we've seen in the tournament leading up to finals day. Um, that was very tight. And then Zoe Aldcroft just, you know, played what a game, moving from second row to blindside flanker, making basically every tackle available to her. Um, 
t tell me, you spoke afterwards about the forwards and the defence and, you know, how incredible that was. Uh, was that what your game, what kind of really wanted for you guys? Um, I think it, we would have liked more balance, given the choice. But at the same time, you've got two physical sides going at it. And it was a little bit fight and fire with fire at times. Um, like you say, Zoe Alcroft is unreal. She used to play fullback. And I can guarantee you one thing, there is no chance I will be swapping into the pack to do that. <laughs> but she, yeah, she's she's unreal. Um, and loads of the forwards were, you should have seen some of them moving around the, the next day. It wasn't it wasn't a, a pretty sight. But um, yeah, it, I, I think we expected it to be close. All, loads of our previous games against France have been really close um, and come down to, to fine margins. Um, but yeah, I think this weekend could be, could be a bit spicy as well. <laughs> I think I think Zoe will probably take player of the tournament for me. All the games I've watched, I wouldn't say I've watched every single game of every nation, but I've watched all the England games and all the France games, and I I just I think she's been fantastic. I think the fullback at um, the French fullback as well was for her debut season. She's been outstanding, but yeah, yeah. Zoe was Zoe's been fantastic. Yeah, so Zoe Zoe and Poppy are nominated along with um, Bujard, the French winger. Um, so obviously rooting for our girls, both of them have been yeah been amazing so hopefully one of them gets it is how is poppy obviously shoulder did she hurt it badly She's or fine. oh right she was milking it was she Honestly. she was trying to make sure she got player of the tournament look i was put my body on the line i was quite i was trying to understand how she actually injured her shoulder because it was uh, your scrum how does an eight injure a shoulder it was on her, her scrum? elbow it was her elbow oh, was it? So she, oh, okay. she'd done it a bit earlier she'd bashed her elbow and then in the scrum because she, she was behind Bryony, her sister and she was trying to our scrum was under pressure so she was trying to give everything she had she didn't let go of her arm and it just kind of I guess hyperextended a little bit, but um, yeah, she's fine. She's on the team sheet this weekend. We were giving her so much, <laughs> we were giving her so much grief. So she went for a scan that evening because she was like, I think, I think I've done a lot. Like, you know, all my all my ligaments and whatnot. I think I've done a lot. Season over. And went for a scan and she's back in training yesterday. So funny. Amazing. These things happen. Amazing. Yep, she'll <laughs> definitely not live that down for a week. Hopefully. <laughs> Now you, um, I mean, let's talk about, we're going to get to the good stuff, but you you didn't have the best start with the boot. Um, so I, I just want to get into that right now. Uh, sorry, no mercy here for you either. Um, how does that affect you mentally? Because obviously in a final, you know, if you could get a bit of scoreboard pressure building early, that, you know, that would stand your team in good stead. Yeah, it's definitely the plan. Um, obviously the first one, it was a decent way out, but I thought I had it, hence having a go at it um, and just pulled it a little bit. And then the second one is the one that you just moved. Like that. Um, because... It was wind, right? Yeah, wind it was so windy. Shocking. Shocking. Uh, it's, ne no. it's never the kicker's fault. Uh, it, it, it fell off the tee. Uh, you know, the ball wasn't inflated well enough. You know, there's loads of, loads of reasons why. I'd, lo I'd love to give all of those excuses, but look, sometimes it happens. You, I don't know what you attribute it to, a lack of concentration, mind somewhere else, or just just one of those things. But um, yeah, hopefully it won't happen again. Mo, one of my best friends was on comms and she was like, oh, she was like, oh, oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she She's not Mrs. Set. Perfect. <laughs> look, oh, look, I'm pretty chill. Like Things like that don't bother me. Obviously you want to put scores on the board and you want to help your team and all of that sort of stuff. But once it's happened you can't do much about it um you get, it's one thing you gotta get used to as a kicker you're gonna miss yeah. the odds yeah exactly the odd setter, and also you'll go and win a game another time so it's yeah. you've got to take the good with the bad a little bit um and the bad with the good so yeah it's one of those i'll take it i'll take it on the chin and then that head injury assessment um you kind of went off and will went <laughs> what and then everyone was worried about whether you were going to come back did you have some doubts yourself um, no, I, I thought I was fine. Um, obviously, that's a huge part of um, the development of the game in terms of having independent doctors and analysts that are picking up on, on stuff like that that they think they see. Um, so I, I'd been tackled and rolled kind of and whiplashed the back of my head on the ground. So I had hit my head. It happens, unfortunately, a, a lot in rugby. Um, so they picked that up and just wanted to double check that everything was all right. Um, so you just go in, you have 10 minutes to answer a load of questions, try and remember things, do balance tests, which my balance is absolutely terrible at the best of time. So like my, luckily my baseline, which obviously they have is terrible. So therefore it only, you, you go against yourself. So 
You're balanced by the drum, I doubt. It's, for, it's, fortunate, it's fortunate you don't play an agility, speed, balance game, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I know. Oh, I sh you'd wonder how you ever make it to the top. <laughs> the, the bit that gets me is when I shut my eyes. So I'm fine, like eyes open, and then they go and close your eyes, and I'm literally like, Woof. Um, so yeah. But but obviously it's it's relative to your baseline, so I was fine and able to come back on. Um, but yeah, it's weird because you're in there and you can hear noises and there's no screen or anything. You can't, you don't know what's going on. So I, as I went back out, I had no idea had we scored, had they scored, what, and it was still nil nil, which was a bit strange. So. <laughs> It was so crazy. When, when you went off, I immediately thought about our conversation last week with Shannon about concussion and head injuries and stuff. And I was just like, oh, please. And then fast forward to the end of the game. Uh, we just have to bookend the kicking conversation with the fact that we need to credit you for getting that kick over. Because did you know that you had to do it that quickly because you were running out of time because you looked very calm? What was going through your head? Yeah, so you get 60 seconds to take a penalty. And obviously at the time i think there was about 90 seconds left on the clock so obviously you want to eke out as much as that as possible so i just had a word <laughs> with the ref and she said like on at 30 which was the clock that i could see like basically your time's up so i think it was about 27 28 when i kicked it look everyone knows what you're doing uh, <laughs> it's just it's part of it you're trying to make sure that the clock's gone dead but um yeah they still had an opportunity um kicked it and yeah luckily we were able to get it off the field and people were pretty happy to say the least yeah it was a it was a pretty intense run into the to the end there so let's get into our conversation with our guest montel who's uh, been sitting and paying close attention <laughs> to all of this rugby chat now on the good the scars and the rugby we like to compare and contrast experiences from different sports and you know talk about training and performing in the big moments and everything that goes into it montel douglas represented great britain in the, at the 2008 Olympics in Beijing in both the 100 and uh, four times 100 meters relay. Now, she reached the final in that one. She won gold in the relay at the Commonwealth Games. There was a bit in the middle there that we will also talk about. And she broke Kathy Cook's British 100 meter record that had stood for 27 years at the time. That's huge. And then as if all of that isn't enough in 2016, she just went, oh, let's do bobsleigh. And within two years, she went to the 2018 Winter Olympics. So she's a double Olympian, winter and summer. Um, and she is on course to go back to Beijing this time to compete in a lot more like her than last time. It's a huge CV. Montel, uh, do people uh, genuinely just get a little uh, jealous, envious, uh, frustrated, exasperated at this crazy list of achievements of yours? And I, I, you know what? Well, I have no idea, but the way you put it so beautifully, I often forget. I've said this before. When you reeled off all that, I'm kind of looking around like, oh, who are they talking about on the screen? Is that who, who's going to come out and sing it? And they're talking, they're talking about me. And even now, I struggle to take on like, oh, yeah, well, I did all that. But I think it's just because I've been so focused on achieving what I wanted to achieve. And I have so much fun with sport. Like, I, I love sport in general, and I love taking the challenge on. Um, so I've just looked at it like that and, and kind of taken it in my stride, really. So that's why I just keep going, because you, you can't beat me unless I stop, right? So. Yeah. How, how, did, how did it uh, come around, the switch over? Because I, I know I, I'm really good friends with Amy Williams, who obviously was a 400-metre runner to start off with, and then she ended up in Skeleton Bob. And that, was, it this, was it a similar process in terms of um, uh, the, the bobsleigh team started identifying sprinters because obviously you need that power to to get that start going and and they they figure they can teach technique whereas they need that raw power out and out first and foremost is that basically how the yeah. conversation went yeah pretty much absolutely like um i had no idea like you said before about bobsleigh i didn't even know we had a team to be honest <laughs> when i was asked and one of the coaches the physical coaches for great britain bobsleigh was actually one of the physical coaches, a British athletics coach. So when I was younger in sport, I knew him and he was trying to get me for about two years before I actually said yes, 20, like 14, 2015. And I was like, oh, I'm still, I'm still running track and I ran really well. Um, and I could, didn't go to European or Commonwealth 2014. I'd missed the team, although I was running really, really well. So I thought, you know what, I might as well try out for, for Bob Stay finally. Um, and kind of went on there because they needed you know, faster, bigger girls because weight moves weight in bobsleigh weight matters we have a minimum weight so we generally you know, i'm five foot ten so it, just comparison on my height alone i've got more mass than people um in general and then i'm a sprinter so it was conversion from 
sprinting on the track to sprinting on ice um, was a lot easier, obviously, for, for me to do that. And they just said, come and try out. And I pretty much got involved and I, and I absolutely loved it. I, I still do. What was that first session like where you got your spikes on or your shoes or whatever the equivalent is, running on ice? What was that like? I'd love well, to, did someone video it? Oh yeah, to be fair, like, <laughs> we had, I had one camp on ice, but it wasn't on the bobsleigh track. Um, we did it in Cestria. We went down to the team first, like brand new, to try and learn technique. And we just had the, the camp there. And then my first experience on the Bob, actually Bobstay track, my, learn, my learning curve was very steep. I basically did six training runs before I had the World Cup competition on the Saturday. So you train Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I had to take all the runs because obviously I'd never been down. And I literally was doing my headshots because you have to have headshots. And they were going, you've got to hurry up and let her go. She's got to go and train because she's not been down before. And they were like, well, you've never been down before. And I'm like, no. And I've got a World Cup, which is equivalent of like in athletics, the Diamond League on the Saturday. And I literally went down the first time. I prayed the whole way down. I got out the bottom and I was like, you've got to do it twice. And I was like, I don't know if I can do that again. I'm not even going to lie. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm a bit of a training junkie, I think, because I like that kind of stuff. And I went, do you know what? Let's, we'll, we'll go again. And, and yeah, absolutely loved it from then on. Wow. Have you had to go driving yet? No, I. I oh, you I, just you just head down and, and go. Please don't, please don't rock us over. Yeah, I really wanted to because I'm a control freak. So I was just like, I'm not about this. Like, what is going on? I don't get to drive. But I started. I mean, I started Bob when I was 31. So there was this whole thing around. Am I too old to drive and learn? And I'm like, I'm a very fast, I'm a very fast yeah. learner as an athlete. But that they, they, they really just, I guess, they really pushed for break women. They wanted fast yeah. girls to kind of get our driver my driver to to get better in competition yeah. so that's why we, we had my, the main focus on that yeah my only again my only uh feel for bobsleigh is i did it when i did the show the jump yeah so yeah i was just in the back hanging on for dear life it, um and just trust the driver will know and then he'll tell me when to break <laughs> and i just yanked that lever <laughs> that's, it. that's yeah. the best bit that's, that's the only thing yeah. you had Oh, you got to, well, oh, I've got a sprint, right, then head down and just hang on. Okay, I can do that. Did I? <laughs> uh, it's, it's such an adrenaline rush, though, isn't it? It's such yeah. a, how, was it just a complete buzz the first time you did it? Yeah, and, and you, if you've done it, you know that. It's kind of indescribable. But you can't really compare it to anything else because, for number one, when you're sprinting as well, we, I don't take any impact. Like, you don't really get hit. You know, I'm not a boxer, I'm not a fighter. I don't really bug me. Like, you used to get smashed in, <laughs> where it's a different kind of getting smashed in because... The G forces are incredible, especially when you're going to certain heights and you're and you're pushing fast. It's like five, six Gs, and I, you know, you, you don't feel that before. So that was the shock, I think, just being able to the impact on your body. That was where I was like, oh my gosh, what is that? And you you're not really sure if you're still in one piece because you can feel the pain, but you're, you're not broken yet. So you got kind of was like, oh, what's going on? Am I am I fine? So I think when you when you've done it, you can then say, oh my gosh, it's great. But it's very difficult to describe it to anything else and compare it. I've seen someone um, describe it as like the Formula One of the Winter Olympics because it's these yeah. little fast cars that, I mean, and it's obviously it is dangerous. Were you this kind of kid? Were you always kind of looking for things to compete at um, and kind of keen on taking big risks? I know that you did pretty well at high jump, yeah. but what else was there? Well, I'm funny enough, I think I've become more risk averse as I've gotten older. It's so strange because when you're a kid, you're like, ah, oh, whatever, break a limb, a spine, got another one. Do you know what I mean? You just kind of get on with it. You don't you don't really see that kind of stuff. And I didn't really worry about those things. I actually asked them when I did Bob's Day. The first thing I asked them, they said, oh, you, you know, you've got to be a bit thick skinned to do it. And I just said, I just want to ask a question. I said, can I die from doing this? And they went, yeah, you'd be fine. And I went, well, fine, then let's go. Because I was like, if I can't die. I'm pretty much gonna, I don't mind doing it. So, but, but being younger and doing those different sports, there's nothing that was kind of like super scary. It was just kind of like, I didn't mind saying, you know, I don't really say no. I always say, yeah, I'll try it out first. So uh, lots of things I tried out, but a bit like Emily was saying about like my balance is honestly, it's awful. Like, <laughs> stuff like <laughs> awful. So anything that was kind of like up high or you've got a back, like, you know, I can't, you're not gonna get me there because I'll just be falling off, getting hurt all the time, which is ironic, obviously, since I did, I got that quite a high level thing. And no one ever approached you and said, how about coming to play wing for our rugby team? Well, they actually, well, kind of sort of they did. I think after, this is probably 2012-ish time or before then, they, they were talking about sevens. 
and people were talking about something like and I was just thinking, I'm gonna get am I gonna get hit? They're like, not if you run fast enough. <laughs> you know? so I've had I've had other teammates that have tried out and it is very different. I have so much respect for you guys because like I could I'm a bit of a fighter, like I could I can take I can give as much as I could take, but I, I'm a bit of like my mouth is bigger than my bite. Do you know what I mean? Like, like, I, 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 if I get hit, I'd be like, oh my God. <laughs> and I think that part of it for me, I was just like, well, I, I would never say no. But as well, I think it's hugely animal when you need to know the game. And, and that's a massive part. If you've not played the game before, and I had never played before ever, not even at school, but, you know, barely tagged when I was young. So when you don't know the game, it doesn't, you can't just be like, throw on the side. When it gives you the ball, can you just take it down? <laughs> right, can you just down and get to that line. I still would. I would still want to have integrity of knowing in the game and really being at that level, just because I think I am. And I don't know if I would have been able to have the time to be able to learn that. If your mouth is as big as is bigger than your bite, you'd be a perfect scrum half. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, we'll try to keep you. Then you don't actually ever get you know, the good scrum halves don't get tackled. We had a massive um, push and scout for the talent transfer athletes when sevens got announced in the Olympics. There was a lot of. Um, kind of looking about for especially like athletes and I remember we were training at we did some training at Lee Valley when we were a sevens program and obviously like we're there with our terrible technique trying to a skip b skip and then there's you lot like you know proper on the money anyway there's a couple of the girls I can't remember who it was now but they were like oh you know give us a go and they were sprinting down the the indoor track and um someone threw a ball at them and they just sprinted perfect te technique and just went because they just <laughs> they weren't used to having to do something else whilst mm -hmm. running as fast as they possibly can um and it, it, yeah it just made me laugh so we don't definitely don't look perfect sprinting but i think it was it was a really odd concept for them to have to do something else <sighs> running but having said that yeah. some of the other nations have found some unbelievable talent transfer athletes we've got some perhaps from their earlier days it makes such a difference. Sevens, raw speed can be everything. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely on the lookout for some more of those for sure. Yeah, Jess Breach, wasn't she a sprint hurdler um, at like English schools level as well? Is she the fastest? Of, I mean, is she probably the one? Yeah, she'd be mm -hmm. up there. So like, yeah, obviously Jess um, transfer. Vicky Fleetwood did heptathlon as a youngster. Celia Kwanzaa has come over playing sevens now. Has done quite a bit of um, athletics. Debs Fleming as well. Deborah Fleming. There's quite a lot of of um, kind of transfer athletes that that did did it to a level. Um, and you can tell, as I say, when we do speed sessions, you can tell the girls that have come from an athletics background and the, the rest of us who are just absolutely winging it. You know, there's there's no technique, there's no um, kind of stature to any of us when we're doing our drills. And then they're just like, pa, pa, pa. So um, it's, it's not the most thing. I tell you what, if you had, Mont <laughs> if you had Montel on the wing, it, with a, what, was, what was it, a 10... Eight five, you ran. Ten nine five, the, yeah. Ten nine five. With wind. Uh, right, with, with, I love that. With wind, with wind. Um, oh. I tell you what, Skaz, you just give her it early and then just support. <laughs> she, she, no, that was like, get near her anyway. Support from the half. Well, yeah, well, maybe for the pop up if she does get tackled. So, um, Montel, you suffered a serious injury, which kind of brought your high jump, your first of the three sporting careers, kind of to an end. And um, in that period, you obviously learned some tough lessons about now deciding what, what's next for you. And un unfortunately, you had that with your knee a little later on, probably, you know, a bit more serious. But what is it that you learned from that first big um, back injury that ended your, uh, your high jump career that you yeah. really kind of draw on? Well, it definitely taught me, like, just use the word, the word resilience around, but it definitely taught me how to just keep going because, the, I've, you know, the first thing I get from a lot of people is just that, oh, you know, I, I would have done that, but I didn't, this happened or this happened, this happened. And for me, I guess even from that age, I'm talking like 14, 15, like giving up was an option because sport for me was lifestyle. It was something that I've always done. I'm always active. It wasn't, I wasn't trying to be a professional athlete. But it was just kind of like you're just stopping me completely from doing it. So I've, rather than me focusing on like, well, I can't do high jump anymore. I was like, well, what can I do? Because you kind of focus on like controlling controllables. So although I can't jump up in the air anymore, can I run fast in a straight line? Yeah, I'm pretty much like I'm pretty I'm pretty safe doing that. And so I kind of just found another avenue, which is I guess why now in my career now, that's been Bob said, it's again the same thing. Those lessons come through because I've looked at it now. Well. 
my, my tax not gone well for how many years, but can I transfer those skills to something else? Absolutely. And, and again, I was like, why not? But I definitely had to, to learn the hard way with that because, you know, someone telling you we're never going to be able to jump again, it's never nice. You're never going to be able to run again. It's never, that's never nice. But I've heard it twice in my career where you're just like, you're done, you're completely done. And I was just like, well, not done yet. Let, let's keep going. And I really did put that into, like, we're doing my high jump. I actually tried to go back to high jump, actually. I didn't do it because my back was completely gone. And I went to a competition. I went, yeah, my back's been fine for ages. And I, in the warm up for the high jump, I went up to the bar jumped up, came back down on the floor, couldn't get back up. And I literally lied there. And I remember going, oh gosh, they were right. I really can't jump anymore. <laughs> like they weren't kidding. And <laughs> even I was just like, now nah, I'll be fine. And I, that was the last time I've ever jumped now because I, I, I'll i just keep going until it's kind of like, hey, you really can't do that. But you, I think you've always got to move the goalpost. You can't just say, oh, this didn't work. and I'm going to stop. It's like, well, how can we find a way to get it done? Wow. And then even around that time that you did break that long standing record, You've um, spoken in other interviews about how seriously you were in the midst of studying. You were, you were not a full-time athlete when you broke that record. You were a full-time student who also was trying to be an athlete at the same time. Was that decision to focus on your studies at least partly informed by this realization that no matter how good you are at something, at, at some point, you know, your body might just literally not be able to do it anymore? Yeah, I often get asked. Like when when did you become when did you want to become a professional athlete? You know you get youngsters that are like five. Oh, I saw the Olympic Games when I was five, whatever. And like, I didn't know anything about athletics. I knew that my dad looked like Linford Christie because everyone told me that wherever we went, and that's from when I was ten years old. That's all I knew about athletics. So I never had a mindset of like like I said, oh, I'm going to do sport full time. I'm it's going to pay me. Uh, for me, academics was huge because like my family didn't go to university. I was the first person to graduate. So me leaving that legacy or just or being the first person in my lineage to like graduate and get a degree literally I graduated the day after I broke the British record so for me to be able to do those it was they're equally for me the same and I think focusing on one actually gave me the ability for freedom to be able to achieve the other because I wasn't so focused like drilled and, and overwhelmed by like oh god I'm trying to make a game it was like what Emily was saying earlier, sometimes you're not going to have good times, bad times, like you're going to have to take them as they go along. You're not going to get every, you're not ever going to get every goal. But then that's what I was thinking. I was just like, well, I'm not going to get every time. I'm not overwhelm myself and kill myself about it and just keep going. And um, to go into my graduation as a British record holder was like an insane feeling, <laughs> like really, really bizarre feeling. I, again, I was just like, what's going on here? But I wasn't trying to go to Olympic Games even. I was just trying to do my best. And, and doing my best actually meant sacrificing a lot of my training time for that, from my studies, so. So even at, even at school, school you, you weren't that serious on sport, you just were good at it, or do, yeah. do you look, and then if, if that was the case, do you look back and go, you wish, wonder how fast you could have gone if, if, it, if you maybe went down that route a bit earlier, or was it not that way? No, I think, no, just because in, I guess when I was younger, like when I got, I said my sporting career in my mind, when I was 16, I was double national champion, the 100 meters at 16 years old. And then at under 20, like 19, I was the fastest junior in the country. But in, remember in that mindset as a kid, I wasn't going, oh yeah, I'm the fastest, I'm the best. But I really wasn't. I was just running fast and I was really enjoying my athletics and it just happens that, I, yeah, and it just happens that I might happen to be good. And I think we all kind of, you know, we like, we like doing things that you're good at. And that's kind of why you, adhere to those things you get better at it and I never went to the the point where I was just like oh no I'm 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 the best at doing this I just happen to be good at it but it I'm really as well like I do my best I'm everything I think it's from my mum like when I was younger she's just all like if you're you gonna do a job do it properly I mean I was hoovering my room at the time so she was probably telling me making sure <laughs> I don't move any crumbs but I got it I got the point where she I got what she was saying. She's like, look, the, the job's worth doing, worth doing properly. So I gave 100% in everything I did at all times anyway. And it just happens that when you do that, I find that's when you get your maximum result. I think I really like what you were saying earlier about having the balance. I think I'm really, really grateful that I wasn't a professional rugby player at 18, like some of the girls are now. I had to go to university. I had to work. Didn't become professional until I was 24 years old. And I think as much as I would have loved to have been a professional athlete at 24, I think it, it grounds you a lot more. It gives you that yeah. better balance. Yes, for life after rugby, but also just an appreciation of, 
that that isn't everything and you do it because you love it and of course you're going to work as hard as you possibly can but mm -hmm. actually at the same time there's a lot of a lot of other things out there do you, did you like so now in your career obviously you've got certain goals and whatnot did, have you started to set goals now more than perhaps you did when you were that youngster in terms of just life stuff or you mean or like in your sport so now obviously you want to go to the next yeah. Winter olympics that sort of stuff but you said earlier that you just did it because you loved it and kept you know you're really yeah. and just kept achieving things yeah i mean when you're 16 that's great but 20 years down the line you kind of like <laughs> you're like it's still fun but you know it's not that fun <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's, got to, there's got to be a balance in this it's kind of like well, why don't you do other things in life and i'm like well i do it because i can because a lot of people can't <laughs> so i'm like i'm gonna run it to the death <laughs> and maximize that like you and like you said it's like you, I didn't you didn't go in like 22 23 24 age being a professional athlete and I wasn't and I actually like, I didn't turn professional really in, after the game but they're like when did you realize you went to professional athlete and I was like after I'd already been to Olympic Games <laughs> because I realized that I could because like Mike was saying earlier I worked from 16 to 22 up until the Olympic Games I was a waitress like part-time so I worked every Christmas day for, for six, six, 16 years old to 22 and I quit my job after the games because I was European number one, I was British record holder. Now, you know, I now can be a professional athlete and, and I've got a degree. Now I can focus on that. But before then it was the journey to then to get to that point when then you can start making those decisions and, and be smart about where you're going. Let's go to Beijing, 08. Um, so you're there at the Bird's Nest Stadium to compete for Team GB and, uh, and I mean, the, the items you competed in, they're, they're, pr they're a pretty big deal, you know, they don't take place in some far flung, you know, place somewhere else. And it's, it's not a, a, a recent inclusion as far as the Olympic Games are concerned. That's, that's the big time. How did you manage uh, the nerves? Uh, obviously, it's useful because you're going to, you know, going for, for another Olympic Games here. But wh what is yeah. it that you got right that time around or that you wish you got right? I think, number one, I guess what I got right is this question. Um, I think I really did maximise the experience. I think it's so difficult sometimes when you're in it as an athlete to, to stay in the moment because you're always concerned about the next step or the next or what you just did or that one wasn't as good. You're always, you're always looking at even forward back. It's very difficult to stay in the moment and actually enjoy walking around the village, seeing other sports people, seeing this beautiful stadium. I mean, to this day, it's my favorite stadium because it looked like a mirage. Like in real life, it doesn't even look like a real thing because it's so beautifully made. And I remember preparing, I had good people around me. My coach had already been to like three Olympic games and got people there. So he was, but obviously well, well equipped in that area. And I remember going to the track before the first day of 100 meters because there's 90,000 people in the stadium. Now our national trials, if you get about 90 people, you're lucky. So to experience that, you need to be prepared for that because it's gonna blow you away. And it did a lot of people, you know, they, they choked because to come up when you walk out, the noise is insane. You're standing down, I remember, I went out to see the stadium beforehand. So that's something we did right because he was like, you need to see the stadium before you go out tomorrow because if you go out and you look up and you hear the roar, you, you need to be prepared. And I remember coming out for the day, walking out and I didn't look up the whole time. I just walked down, they walked you out in, in the line and I looked down and I put my bag down. And then I remember that was the time when I took a breath and I looked up and it was just covered with people, you know, it was a sea of, of people. And you then realize, well, you're obviously in your country, there's cameras everywhere. It's the biggest stage in the world and you're doing the 100 meters and, and, and it's now. Like the 11 seconds you've got to run, I've got to be the best ones right this second. So we did that well. But I think what I didn't do well looking back, which was I am now, I now use going forward, is I didn't really set a performance goal. I, I did what I've always done, which was do my best. I was like, we're going to do my best, going to do my best. When I think if we had approached it and said, we're going there to do X, we're going there to do Y, if we do that, we're doing well it might have looked different because you then have something that you've achieved and you, you know what you're doing. I was literally going there to do my best. And I think because the Olympics that year for me was a bonus because we weren't, we were trying for it, but like I said, I had university and stuff like that. And I was focused on my age group. It wasn't the main thing in my mind. I was like, study first. And then suddenly I was like, okay, now we're here at the games. Focus on what the task is. So that's what I'm using now going forward. I'm like, right now we want to perform. I was like, no, we're going there to get X. We're going there to do this. And I, I've learned from that, like the 14, 15 years ago, what I did then, what I want to do now. 
Geez, it sounds incredible. Um, just, you know, the experience of being there and on that big a stage. Any any good story? Who's the fa who is the best person you met in the village? Oh, gosh. Who's the best? Well, I guess I can't not say you same because, because I can't not. You met, you met him at KFC, did you? Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. Because it was, um, obviously, he, he, that was the first time the world knew him. He'd already been to World Camps before, yeah. but he didn't do well. And... Um, that was the first time I remember being, I was in the stadium watching it live, the world record. And it was the first time people had know, known his name. And then I went to, I was saying one of my things, I went to his birthday party, because his birthday's in August. He's always He always has a birthday at any championship because birthday's in August. So in his 22nd birthday party, because we're the same age, you know, it's the Puma, it's, it's a party, and we're all at the Olympic Games, we're all young. It's like a great time. Like, <laughs> you can't replicate those memories. So for me, it's huge because they are spaces and people that you would never have otherwise be around and also experience an athlete coming from I mean he was in a final but he like came fifth or sixth or seventh before to then go and break be the fastest of all time the following year I mean it shows the kind of dedication and work and what you've got to do to get that so that I definitely took that on because I remember seeing him in in the in the um canteen hall walking up to McDonald's as they got famous for doing um <laughs> and I, I remember he just walking in there he was on his own headphones on singing and dancing to himself like it, it looked a bit like a lunatic to be honest <laughs> like you saw him from afar, you'd be like, oh, I'm not going to go speak to him. But that's just his character. It was exactly how he was and exactly how he is now. And to see that as an athlete, a young athlete, do that and perform so well was is super inspiring. So are you guys still buddies? Do you do you have him no, like your no, WhatsApp? No, I'm, I'm just like in the stalker in the DMs. I'm joking. <laughs> no, he keeps keep trying to get to a, a, any championship. Just a, <laughs> can I go in August, please? I know, he's, I know there's a birthday party in there. I, I want in. Literally, that's it. I mean, now we're... Yeah, but, I don't know at 35, our birthday party is looking a little bit different. <laughs> so they're not as fun as they are when you're 22. Um, but I, I think just as like the, the professional side of things and knowing the kind of athlete that he is and what he's been, it's, it's been nice because it's, it, the, the down to earthness for me is something that's really admirable. Okay, so you come back home from Beijing, you turn pro, you don't have to waitress anymore, you know, all of these nice things happen. And then you have your knee cartilage injury uh, which, by the sounds of it, shouldn't be such a big deal, or was it? Please explain. Well, it didn't feel big. It didn't. But when I went in and the doctor was like, literally looking at me in silence. Like the doctor, this doctor's not silent. He, he's very vocal. We <laughs> call him Dr. Death. <laughs> like he's very traumatic. So when he's silent for quite a few minutes, I'm like, this can't be good. And he was just like, oh, I'm a bit concerned by this area. It was just dark. And so I like literally from having a knee pinch in my knee from like the Friday, going to the doctors and late like 10 o'clock at night, the next day I was in the, I was in the consultancy office. And then the surgeon, I, I'm facing a surgeon and he's saying to me, you know, you know you, you're not going to be able to run as fast as you run ever again. And I'm like, what? And he was just like, you're probably not going to run for the whole year. Like you're going to be out for a very long time. And you, you're going to have to non wait there for three months. So like when you come from, running the fastest time of all time and then the doctor's going you can't walk it's such a far different away that you have to regroup and go okay well now what then because he's saying to me that it's never gonna happen again and again I went back to what had happened when I was high jumping it was it was pretty much it was like career threatening in surgery because I think in in other sports it might not have been because in track you know you, you've got to be 95 percent you've got no one there's no one else when you're on the starting line if you're not 95 98 percent it's going to show up. You can't get you can't get away with those margins. You have to be almost at peak all the time when you're there. So they kind of take things differently in terms of getting back. You can come back a little quicker in certain team sports, maybe the same injury because you're like 80% because of contact time and what you're going to be able to do physically. You can build to that. We didn't have that privilege. So you know, three months, I wasn't I wasn't even walking. Like I was hopping to the toilet. And I was like, wow, how the mic has fallen. But, you know, I had to learn how to walk again. And I'm just like, what is going on? But again, I focused on the stuff that I could do. So I was jumping on one leg. I was doing bike sessions on one leg. I was cleaning with one leg. You know, I was, I was getting strong. And everything I could do on one leg, I was doing it. Because I just said to myself, look, when this leg is ready to put up, go on the ground, I'm like, we're going to be ready for it. <laughs> like, I'm not going to wait. I'm going to get ready. And I, I used those kind of tools that I used how many years ago to work through my rehab and get back and, and made the Commonwealth team 10 months later. Can I, 
just go back to obviously turning pro and now when everyone says you turn pro they expect that the the, the floodgates of cash open which unfortunately for the majority of sports whether it be <laughs> uh, whatever it be and especially athletics i know it's it's not quite that simple or quite that easy how how was that obviously it, it we, was it all lottery funded stuff were there sponsors within that because uh, i i want to paint a realistic picture of what professional sport for athletes athletes is it's sometimes not what yeah. they think it is yeah um, everyone i think yeah, you're totally right it's it's that they are a little bit deluded by stuff that's going on and it's not fair to say that it's the sport i guess it's it's the like the one percent so you'll see household names and those people you'll be able to see will be in a different category and class you know that but they are going to be even in this country certain individuals you'll know that they will be a lot better off financially whether it's sponsorship whether it's um, not funding because of the household name. I guess things as well look, look so different. Uh, they do like how many years ago is it now? 14 years ago now they do now. Like I literally signed up to Facebook on in 2000, the year before the Olympic Games, I mean Facebook. And I didn't even know what it was. I think I was calling it the book of faces at the time because <laughs> I, no one knew what it was. And we just signed up. Whereas I think if you're, if I'm the same sprinter as I am now in 2000 and like 20, 21, 22, like I, I it's completely different ball game because Social media is crazy. There's so much access. There's so much out there. It's a completely different way of amateur and professional sport. So at the time, I was I was got lottery funding from the games. But actually, what you're saying about lottery funding, I actually my lottery funded from before got pulled after about the British record, and I actually had to appeal for it. Lit the October after the games in August, I had to appeal for my own funding in October because they pulled my funding and was like, we don't think you're going to be able to do it. And I'm like, what? I'm European number one. <laughs> what, what do you mean? I was like top twenty in the world, like fifteen. Or, what do you mean? But I had to go to court. I had to go and prove and get my funding back because they were like, no, nope, it's not enough. Blah blah blah. And I got my funding back because externals look. They look at the, the appeal and they were like, well, this is ridiculous. But like, I don't know how you've even said this. And I got it back. But the fact that I had to even appeal in the first place shows the levels of that. It's not all roses. You're not all going to be getting what you want and how you want it and make it easy. Like I said, I, I worked my way up. Then did that become harder with the injury and everything? No, that was before. That was literally August. I competed at the games. Oh wait, I went on holiday with the girls, came back, and they bring the funding out and they pulled my funding. They took me off of B funding, which is not even the top rank. Do you need to get a medal for certain funding? And they pulled it and they said no funding, and I had to appeal for it. And I won the appeal because obviously it was a ridiculous decision. Um, but they, the, the governing body, had pulled it themselves. And then you go into bobsleigh, which has also, I, I read stories about uh, crowdfunding your way to great big international competitions and stuff, just because there wasn't all that much support. And um, so, I mean, clearly that isn't going to stop you, uh, no. but it's, it seems to be a very, um, you know, kind of consistent narrative. It, it's not just an athletics conversation. Yeah, no, definitely. It, it's, it's different for different spaces like with bobsleigh it was completely mismanaged you know it, the governing body and its whole and it for me going in from athletics which is i think it's actually well, well run in the sense that it's the professionalism of it is different you know bobsleigh is a very services sport it comes from the army it comes from the navy it comes from the services so i feel like it's an elite sport within it's trying to be an elite sport and it hasn't really got the elite part quite right yet in terms of how it's organized how it's structured and i think they struggle with that and essentially you know it's just mismanagement in terms of resources which meant that the athletes then suffer and you know like you said they pulled up funding me i don't get absolutely any sponsorship i work full time like 40 hours a week and then train 20 hours a week and try and fit those things in to then try and you know do things like make history but like you said it's it's doing that and finding a way of quitting and not doing it and to me, if I quit, I'm only going to be killing, like hurting myself. No one else is going to care. <laughs> I'm not. If I'm not, they don't care. But I, I will. And then, how does that? But then, if with, with all the funding stuff, obviously, I'm, I'm imagining that the uh, the bob the bobsleighs are designed the top of the the top of the chain, and probably designed by I don't know, McLaren or something else. Does it, does that then have a knock on effect, or do, is there always been a good partnership in terms of your equipment that you're t you're taking and going down the sled, and is is always in tip top nick because i yeah. can imagine that costs a bit oh yeah boss is not a cheap sport i mean we went away from november the 5th i went away and i got back three weeks ago i, I was away for close to five months of this year 
and that's like when you when you're when you're a worker so you're employed you're not full-time athlete i don't have sponsors which means how am i paying for life <laughs> at that time when you're away from home you know we're in a lockdown all that kind of stuff so it's not cheap sport because you have those variables travel you do have like you said equipment testing and we're as a team and um, team mcneil we we sponsored by dhl so they're able to support we just got a new sled last year and sleds are not cheap like you said However, in terms of putting so much in, it's expensive to do all that equipment and the best teams in the world absolutely benefit from it. I mean, one of the best teams, or also the best team of all time, I'll be arguing it now, the driver, they have specific, like their own special sleds that have equipment um, work going into it. So all this research to make it better. So they basically custom design their sled. And with Bobsleigh, there's three variables. It's your start, it's your drive and your equipment. If you have those three at the top of the game, then you're fine. If you have no not great start like us and we have great equipment, great drive, you do okay. Vice versa, if you have a great equipment and great start but not a good drive, you know, you, you can't you have to have all the variables. And once you kind of tick those variables, including like your research into sled and making it better within the constraints that you can, then you're on to winner. But you have to have those and those things cost money. How do you manage work and being away for five months? Is everything <laughs> like online because i know say for us we have no control over our schedule so actually if i've got other things that i need to fit in or whatever it's it's all around that it's not oh can i just move this here because i've got to do this that's that, you yeah, know no. that luxury yeah it's funny actually you said that because it's different you so you said i might now fit in training around work whereas i guess you're saying that you have training you if you want to do anything else you're fitting that around that yeah. so yeah i literally have a, a timetable my week and I've, i'm fitting training on where I can fit, so it's not structured in the sense that it won't be every morning between 10 and one. It sometimes it's like tonight I'll be training because I'm work all day. It will be like tonight I'll be there from like six to eight, six to nine training that, that way around. But I think you, I always look at it as like, right now when I was away in terms of the first few years, I was basically saving in the summer, but obviously you're saving for double time. So like you're working your butt off between March and the kind of August, September like double money pretty much to try and save so I'd save as much as I could so that it would spread over the next months that I was away and I've been doing that for a few years now but you know you burn the candle at both ends there's only so much you can do you can imagine it's only so much time and especially last year with lockdown I mean when you're when you're working in I work in schools I do stuff with it, everything went you know you lose like 70 70 percent income completely just went so it gave me more time to train which was great minus having injuries but unfortunately, it gives you less <laughs> funds to then go into a season, a pre-Olympic season. That's really important to then prepare properly. And that's what the variables that I'm looking at now for this year. I mean, we've got Olympic Games in how many months? Three Under 300 days now. You have to do everything you possibly can to be able to get there. And you have to make sacrifices uh, the best way you can. So besides competing uh, for your country and all of the media trained answers, what makes this worthwhile? Because that sounds like a lot to manage. It is. I should take a breath. <laughs> it is. It is a lot. To manage. What it makes it all worth it is, on it, for me, I guess on a, the, my why is, I've, I've never really, like when you, when you introduced me earlier, I've never seen myself as that athlete. So when I reel off stuff and say, okay, I've got a degree, I'm the first person in my family to do that. I've been, a, I'm an Olympian, I'm a British record. When I label stuff like that as achievements, I never look at them as saying, oh, I've done something crazy. Like, I don't look at it like that, but I, I am aware that I, I get into positions where I can do things that people haven't done before. That excites me because I don't even know if I can do it. And someone asked me, the other day so where, what's the end goal for you if you look back on your career what would you have said you can do and I said well the beautiful thing about it is that I don't know what I can do it's to me honestly it's limitless which is why I keep going because every time you get a new challenge they're like oh well you get the you know the first female no females woman, women has done a been a summer uh winter olympian before I'm like well you could you can do that and why would you not try if that's something that you love and enjoy and because that inspires people that inspires you know families that inspires your friends my own aunt went back to university after in her late 30s because I got because I went to university and she said to me oh, I went back because you, I thought you did it then I mean I could do it because we never we weren't raised that you you know go to university we were like 16 go off to work and you when you show up that you can do it differently and say well why can't we do it someone else is looking at you going actually because you can I'm going to try that is so beautiful gosh okay so 2020 winter olympics beijing 
14 years after you competed at the Summer Olympics, you're going back for the Winter Olympics. What is the goal for that Olympic Games? The goal would absolutely be a medal for us. Um, we had a great performance last time, with girls. Um, I, and I really do think we could do it. It's not, I wouldn't try it and say, oh, well, I'm going to aim for that. I'm not kind of, I never aim for things that are unachievable, as you will, will know. Because you didn't, when you don't know you can be the fastest of all time, you just try and run your fastest. If it happens to be the fastest of all time, then you take it. You know what I mean? But um, I think we're really realistic, but I think we do have work to do. And it, be, it will determine how well we prepare. So for us, we absolutely are saying medal because we have a great shot at it. Um, I think we have all the components right now, the best we've had to go for that, but it's not going to be easy. Um, but for me, the goal first is just getting there. Uh, like my personal goal is being on the start line and you know, hands on the thingy, doing my clap and, and seeing our you know, name pop up for, for Great Britain and been an, announcing myself as a summer and Olympian. That's my personal goal. Wow. So cool. Thank you so much. I can understand why you are such a popular speaker at schools um, because I'm sure so many people just learn so much from uh, the amazing energy you have for everything you're busy with. Thank you for your time. It was so good to have you on the show. Thank you, Alma. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Montel. <laughs> and, and good luck to you, um, Emily, with the friendly uh, yeah. this weekend against France. <laughs> Play there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the most, most non-friendly friendly that it'll ever have been, I think. So it's, it's always the uh, the comedy of rugby is having a friendly where you've still got to go and smash each other up anyway. So it's quite hard to <laughs> make sure. But this is it is one of the harder ones though because you've got to go full ball because if you don't go full ball you'll get injured or you'll you'll do something. So oh, hundred yeah. percent. And we've managed to build up this decent record against them now as well. I think we've won the last eight from eight. They're in our World Cup pool, so there's no off the gas for this there's zero friendliness about it um it's going to be it's a, it's a test match really it's a proper test match yeah okay. you don't want to you don't want to ever want to give the french a little chink in the armor that they can <laughs> give, give them a little bit of confidence just keep hammering them and then they, they'll keep wilting sorry any frenchman that listen to this <laughs> sorry, sorry, not sorry. veronique is going to be on our twitter like yeah. like this <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> Well, that's it for the good, the scars and the rugby together with our friends at Allianz for this week. Thank you to Emily, our superstar, uh, to Mike Tyndall and to Montal. Don't forget to catch this week's The Good, The Bad and the Rugby where Alex, James and Mike are joined by the uh, Wales and Lions physical performance manager. That's his official title, but uh, he's got many subtitles and um, alter egos. His real name is Paul Stridgen and you should definitely go Go listen to this one. Uh, you can download it wherever you get your podcasts or watch it on YouTube. Thanks again for your company. That's it for now. Goodbye.